Last week, we began looking at some themes from First and Second Peter. Before we can get into tonight's, into tonight's lesson about suffering as a theme in, in First Peter, we have to get some history, especially in an effort to understand a section of First Peter chapter 4 that's very, very difficult. We need to remember that Christians were about to face severe persecution from Rome. They had been facing persecution from the Jews, but the Jews didn't have all that much power against them, and so they enlisted the Romans to persecute Christians. And, of course, Nero, after the great fire in Rome in July of uh, AD 64, blamed the fire on Christians and persecuted them in unbelievable ways. We've talked about this in one of our Wednesday night classes, how they were sewn into skin bags, how they were uh, set upon by wild beasts, they were crucified, they were burned as torches for lighting at, at uh, garden parties. But eventually, the persecution that had been so severe against Christians was turned toward the Jews. In February of AD 67, the order was issued to destroy Jerusalem. Cestus Gallius led a Roman army in a siege against Jerusalem, and this siege surrounded Jerusalem so no one could come in or go out. At one point, for no reason that historians can explain at all, he withdrew his armies. Josephus was unable to account for why. He just led his armies away from the, the siege of Jerusalem. But Jesus had already explained this in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 22. He had warned Christians so that they would be ready when this time came and they would know to flee to the mountains. This was the hand of God providing uh, safety for them. And they fled uh, from Jerusalem. But at that time, when the siege opened up and the city was open, many, many Jews fled into Jerusalem instead of Christians fled out, but Jews fled into Jerusalem. The siege began again, and on the 10th of August, A.D. 70, the Jewish temple was burned. Here's a quote from Josephus. He says, No one can conceive a louder, more terrible shriek then arose from all sides during the burning of the temple. The hill on which the temple stood was seething hot and seemed to envelop its base, enveloped to the base in one sheet of flame. The blood was larger in quantity than the fire, and those that were slain more in number than those that slew them. The ground was nowhere visible, all was covered with corpses, and over these heaps, the soldiers pursued the, the fugitives. This number may be exaggerated, I don't know, but the number is estimated at 1.1 million slain at that time. 11,000 Jews perished from starvation after the siege. 97,000 were carried captive and sold as slaves, sent to the mines, sent to fight as gladiators. Remember that at that time, Jerusalem as a city had a population of only about 20,000 people. Modern Jerusalem only has about 80,000 people. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. Before we get into this lesson on suffering and, and an attitude that we need to have towards suffering, let's notice one of the most difficult passages in this letter. Beginning in verse 12, Beloved, think, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye shall be glad also with exceeding joy. And if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Verse 15, but let none of you suffer as a murderer, 
or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. There is a trial coming. I do not believe that the trial that is mentioned in verse 12 is the fall of Jerusalem. Because he's warning Christians that had been scattered abroad. That's who this letter was written to. Christians that had been scattered abroad, not people who were living in Jerusalem, not people who were gathered in Jerusalem, but he's warning Christians who had been scattered abroad that this trial was coming to them. This trial was also considered in what we read here as partaking of Christ's sufferings. And the destruction of Jerusalem could hardly be classified in that way. It included, in fact, in verse 14, being reproached for the name of Christ. The trial included, verse 16, suffering as a Christian. And then he says that judgment must begin at the house of God. The house of God, since Isaiah chapter 2, has been the church. It was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 2, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So this trial that he mentions in verse 12, I believe, is the persecution that they faced under Nero and even others. And he says that judgment must begin at the house of God. The context here is Christians suffering not Jews suffering. However, he says in verse 18, if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? This is a very strange verse because as far as the salvation of our souls, we are not scarcely saved, folks. In 2 Peter, chapter 1, as he tells them to add to their faith virtue and virtue knowledge and so forth, he says, if you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so, in this manner, by doing these things, an entrance shall be ministered to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We are not scarcely saved. I don't believe then that he's talking about the salvation of their souls in this case. But the fiery trial which came upon them, they were scarcely saved. They were saved with much effort. That word can be translated. In fact, uh, much work. I believe it's translated in Acts 27 and verse 16 when they had to work hard to secure the, the ship that they were on in, in the midst of a storm. The righteous were with much trouble saved from the persecution that they faced. But notice this in verses 17, 18, and 19. The time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? You see, this Roman persecution came on the church. But then it shifted and it was turned toward the Jews. It began at the house of God. But... What shall be the end of those that obey not the gospel of God? If the righteous are saved only by much effort, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? I believe there he is talking about the fall of Jerusalem and the fact that, that the power of Rome was turned toward the Jews and that they were destroyed in the terrible way that they were. You may read something slightly different into this passage. Many people do, okay? And I'm not wanting to have a fight about it. That's not the point. <clears throat> but I wanted to give some kind of explanation of this as we look at the theme of suffering as it occurs here in First Peter. As we think about this theme, 
here in First Peter. And, and it's interesting to me that this theme of suffering really only is emphasized in First Peter, not First and Second Peter. The, the one we looked at last week, it, it ran throughout both books. But this one is really only emphasized here in the book of First Peter. But as we go through it, if we think of the book as a stream, we, we run across passages going down through this stream that refer to suffering again and again and teach us certain things about suffering. So let's start by reading these passages. The first is found in chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. He says there, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Remember, that word temptation can be variously translated. It has two basic meanings. One is temptation to do something wrong, but the other is a trial. And that's really the meaning here. He, in fact, he goes on to say, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations or trials, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. He's talking about a heaviness here. He's talking about various trials that they will face and that that trial of their faith can prove their faith and be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. In chapter 2 and verse 18, he says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and the gentle, but also to the froward or the wayward. This is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were we called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. As we go down through this stream of First Peter, we see in chapter 3 and verse 9, well, let's begin in verse 8, Finally be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, but contrariwise blessing, knowing that thereunto are ye called, that ye should inherit a blessing. In chapter 3 and verse 13, Who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? But and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled." But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that would ask a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation or manner of life in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. In chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind or attitude. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. And then we've already read in chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. I don't want to take time to read that again right now. Uh, but look over at chapter 5 and verse 7. 
Casting all your care on him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, watch this, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. And verse 10, but the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you, to whom be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So much in this little book here about suffering, it clearly is a theme that he returns to over and over again. And there are some things that he admonishes us about that we need to take time to consider and to think about. The first of these is that suffering is temporary. Suffering is temporary. You can smile at least. It's not going to go on forever. Suffering is temporary. There's the old uh, story about the, the preacher who said that the, his uh, favorite words in Scripture were, it came to pass. He said, it didn't come to stay, it came to pass. <laughs> Suffering is temporary. Uh, and, and the Scriptures here are uh, really emphasize that. If we go back, and we need to look at these again under these headings, but in, in chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now, notice these words, for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations or trials, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Christ Jesus. Suffering is temporary. We mentioned this morning in our sermon, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment. There's that temporary idea. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us or produces for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. So suffering is temporary. What a glorious thought. What a terrible thought if we're on the other side of this and we understand that the suffering of hell is eternal. What a terrible thought. But what a glorious thought that the suffering we experience here as Christian people trying to serve our God is a temporary thing. Suffering, number two, should not come from our sin. Now, suffering can come from sin. Now, we need to be careful about this doctrinally because suffering does not always come because we sin. There are people who believe that, and they evidently believe that in Jesus' day. You remember in John chapter 9, it says as they passed by, they beheld a man that was born blind. And they said, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus said, neither this man nor his parents have sinned but that the works of God might be made manifest in him. They thought that every time someone suffered, it must be because of something that they did wrong. That's not true. It was not true in Job's case. It's, it's simply not a, a fact of life. It is not a truth. But sometimes people suffer for what they have done wrong. Look at chapter 2 and verse 19. This is thankworthy that if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully, for what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye you take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable before God. In chapter 3, again, verses 16 and 17, having a good conscience, that wherein the, whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. It is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. It is possible for people to suffer for their sins. In chapter 4 and verse 15, let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. I know a man in Zambia who was falsely convicted of a crime. <clears throat> now, the reason that I believe uh, 
he, he was a Christian man. The reason I believe he was falsely convicted of that crime is because after he spent some years in prison, it was proven that he did not commit the crime and he was released from prison because of that. He was suffering wrongfully. But there were many, many people in that same prison who were suffering justly, who were suffering because of their own sin. David suffered because of his own sin. Nathan said to him after his sin with Bathsheba, because thou hast done this thing, because you did this sin, you're never going to have rest in your household. You're, the enemies are going to rise up to you out of your own household. He was suffering for his own sin. You know, Jonah suffered, didn't he? I can't imagine what it was like in the belly of a whale for three days and three nights. I can't imagine what that would be like. Claustrophobia is probably my worst fear. And he was suffering. But he did it to himself. He brought it upon himself. And what we are being urged here is that our suffering should never come from our evil doings. I had an opportunity, when I say an opportunity, a responsibility, it wasn't a good thing, it wasn't a pleasant thing, but I had to interact with and deal with a, a man, a, a young man, who had just sexually abused a small boy. I mean, just hours before. And I had the responsibility of reporting this and dealing with the man until it could be dealt with and so forth. But as I was sitting there with that man, he actually looked at me and said, why did God do this to me? God didn't do it to him. Whatever he was going to face as a result of this was his own doing. Suffering as an evildoer. And the urging here is that our suffering should never come from our sin. And we live righteous lives. But there's another thing we need to think about along those lines, and that's that suffering should not lead us to sin. Suffering is not an excuse for sin. It's not an excuse for sins of commission where we do things that God doesn't want us to do, where we snap at people, where we treat people badly. It's not, it's not an excuse for that. It's not a, a, an excuse for sins of omission, where we don't do the things that God wants us to do. Suffering is not an excuse for sin. And it should never lead us to evil doings. Last week, the whole lesson from First and Second Peter was about being pure people. And continuing to be poor, pure. If here we go back again to verses 6 and 7 in chapter 1. Remembering that for a season, if need be, we're in heaviness through manifold or various trials. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perish, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Suffering does not give us an excuse for not shining as lights. For not bringing glory to God. In chapter 2 and verse 20. What glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you take it patiently. But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were you called because Christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. What did Jesus do when he suffered? More importantly, what did he not do when he suffered? He did no sin. Neither was guile found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Chapter 3 and verse 9 deals with this idea. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing. Stop and think about that. Isn't that what Jesus commanded us in Matthew chapter 5 when he said, love your enemies? And he said, bless them that curse you. That's what he's talking about. When we're being reviled, when we're being cursed, we're supposed to bless the one that's doing that. That means to speak, speak well to them or speak well about them. 
That's what it means to bless them. And that's what Jesus did here. That's what this verse is teaching us. Um, in chapter 3 and verse 9, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that hereunto are ye called, ye should inherit a blessing. Suffering should never lead us to do evil. Chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. He that is suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. Not that suffering leads us to sin, but we suffer in the flesh for the cause, for Christ. We cease from sin, that he should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. Suffering is temporary. Suffering should not come from sin, and it should not lead us to sin. And then number four, suffering can be glorious and rewarding if we suffer properly, if we suffer purely, if we suffer patiently. Suffering itself can be a glorious thing to be rewarded. And so many of these passages talk about that. In chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, again, especially at the end of 7, that our faith is tried by fire, but that we might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Um, in chapter 2, again, verses 19 through 21, there's no glory in verse 20 if we're buffeted for our faults and take it patiently. But there is glory if we suffer for righteousness and we take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. Chapter 3 and verse 14 hits on this idea. If you suffer for righteousness sake, happy are you and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. And in chapter 4, verse uh, 12 through 16 Let's notice especially verse 16. If any man suffer as a Christian, one of, I believe, three times that the word Christian is used in Scripture, right? Twice in Acts and once here. If any of you suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Suffering properly, purely, and patiently. For righteousness is a glorious thing, and it is to be rewarded. We've got just a couple of minutes here. Let me mention to you some examples of this in Scripture. Job, of course. He suffered. Oh, did he suffer. He suffered in one day more loss and grief than, than we can imagine. And that day... He took it patiently. <laughs> he said, the Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You say, well, what was his reward for that? James tells us in James chapter 5, reminds us of how he suffered patiently, how Job suffered patiently. And he said, remember the tender mercy that God showed to him at the end, after he endured the grief and continued in his faithfulness. Remember the attitude of Job when he said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That is the attitude we need when we face suffering. But also think about another man, and I know some of you are going to nod your heads at this one. Joseph suffered. He suffered from his own brothers. I can't imagine what it was like at the bottom of a pit listening to your brothers arguing about whether to kill you or sell you. You talk about a low point. And then he was sold into slavery. And through diligence and through the hand of God especially, he rose to a position of prominence in the house of Potiphar until Potiphar's wife made a false accusation and then he suffered. And he went to prison. In Genesis chapter 45, if you want to turn your Bibles back there. 
we see something about Joseph that we need to learn and we need to emulate. In Genesis 45 and verse 3, when Joseph is identifying himself to his brothers who don't even recognize him any longer. Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. Doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. They came near. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now, before we read the rest of this, think about the position he was in. He was arguably one of the most powerful men on the face of the earth at this point. Having these men killed would have meant nothing. He had the power to do that at the snap of a finger. But look at what he says. Verse 5. Now therefore be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years into which there shall be neither earing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sold me hither, but God, and he hath made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. You read in Matthew chapter 5, love your enemies. And you say, how in the world can I do that? Here's someone to emulate. Here's someone that shows us what it means to love your enemies. Over in chapter 50, after their father had died, verse 15 when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did to him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, For so shall you say unto Joseph, or so shall you say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin. I don't know if the, if the father really did say that, or if they're just making this up, trying to get out of, the retribution that they fear. I don't really know. It could be that he did say this. But he says, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil, and now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. His brethren went also and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? As for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. If we're going to develop this attitude about suffering, we're going to have to think about the good of more than just us. We're going to have to stop just looking at how things affect me and how upset I was and how hurt I was. And we have to look at a bigger picture and see the good that can be brought about. Because suffering righteously is a glorious thing, and it is to be rewarded. I want to share this poem with you. Some of you have heard it. I have used it at uh, funerals and so forth. And I, ne I never use it with the idea of correcting the thinking of people who are grieving. It's not meant as an admonishment. It's meant as a glorious truth that when we trust in it, when we really believe it, what this poem is trying to say, suffering doesn't seem such a hard thing. It was written by Samuel Rodegast, who lived 1649 to 1708, and it's entitled, Whatever My God Ordains is Right. Whatever my God ordains is right. His will is ever just. However, now he orders my cause, I will be still and trust. He is my God, though dark my road. He holds me that I shall not fall. Wherefore, to him I leave it all. Whatever my God ordains is right. Though I the cup must drink that bitter seems to my faint heart, I will not fear nor shrink. Tears pass away with dawn of day. Remember, suffering is temporary. 
Tears pass away with dawn of day. Sweet comfort shall yet fill my heart, and pain and sorrow all depart. Whatever my God ordains is right. My light, my life is he who cannot will me aught but good. I trust him utterly. For well I know, in joy or woe, we soon shall see as sunlight clear how faithful was our guardian here. Whatever my God ordains is right. Here will I take my stand. Though sorrow, need, or death make earth for me a desert land. My Father's care is round me there. He holds me that I shall not fall. Wherefore to him I leave it all. We're going to suffer. We are suffering. We have suffered. But our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. We get ready to sing this invitation song. We need to stop and consider what it means. An invitation song. We're inviting you. If you have not been baptized into Jesus for the remission of your sins, based on your faith and repentance and confession, if you are not walking in the light as he is in the light, we're inviting you to come and do whatever is necessary to make yourself right with God before it's everlasting too late. He is faithful.